In this segment, we will talk about sequences, which is a mathematical object that finds a lot of use in modeling for various disciplines, including life sciences. Today, we'll talk about their definition. We'll talk about the notations for the sequence. We will talk how you can define a sequence. And finally, we will spend some time discussing how you can use a sequence in life sciences. Um, this is just the beginning of the discussion. We will continue discussing sequences in the next uh, segments too, but let's get started. Let's start with a definition. An infinite sequence is an ordered list of numbers. And what that means, we know which numbers go first, which numbers go second, which number goes third, and so on. There's no ambiguity in knowing where the number will appear. If we know that, we have a sequence of numbers. Now, the notations that we use, we either give sequence a name, some, for example, this sequence would have a name A, and then we would indicate the index of the sequence element. So here, A sub 1 is the first element, A sub 2 is the second element, A sub 3 is the third, and so on. The symbol N is the index of the sequence, and the notations that we use, so this is a couple of notations. So first of all, we use the curly brackets to indicate that it's a sequence. A2 and so on is a sequence. And also, uh, we can indicate the first value of the index. And we also can indicate the last value of index. These notations will give you all information about the sequence that you need to know, where the index starts, when the index end, ends. In this particular case, index doesn't end, it continues all the way to infinity. Now, when the context allows you to um, skip this much detail when we already know where n uh, starts and it ends, we can skip and we can just put the curly brackets. We know that we can also view a sequence as a function. Each element of the sequence we can think as the output of some function f evaluated for a net, on a natural number n. So for each natural number, the function will return a value, and that value will be an uh, element of a sequence. So we can think of a sequence as a function on natural numbers. And the last comment is that it's not necessary or required that the index, index of a sequence starts with 1. It goes with the convenience. Sometimes it's more convenient to start with n equals 0. Sometimes you will start the sequence at a negative number. The most important thing is that you know which goes first, which goes next, which goes after that, the order of the integers. But what is the value of the index? It is secondary. It can start uh, at zero. It can start at a negative number. It can start at a positive number. So let's go through a few examples, and we'll just um, practice with the notations. How do you define a sequence? Well, if in the simplest case, uh, we define a sequence by pretty much giving that function f that allows you to compute all elements of the sequence explicitly. So if the sequence is defined with, by explicit formula, then that formula is used to compute elements of the sequence. Here's the first example. Find first six terms of the following sequence. So here we have an expression, n squared minus 1, that determines elements of the sequence. And we know that the index starts with 1 and continues, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and so on, to infinity. So what we need to do, we need to find first six terms. Our first term corresponds to the very first value of the index, which would be 1. That's the very first value of the index. And this term, according to this formula, would be 1 squared minus 1, which is 0. Very well. Now let's go to the second term. 
The second term will correspond in this case to m equals 2, and we have a sub 2 equals 2 squared minus 1. 2 squared is 4 minus 1 makes 3. Okay, so let's go for the third term. Well, m equals 3 gives us the third term. We'll have 3 squared minus 1. 3 squared is 9 minus 1 makes 8. Uh, finally, uh, we'll have n equals 4 and n equals 5 and n equals 6. All right, so let me do it real quick. So 4 is 4 squared minus 1 makes 15. A5 minus 5 squared minus 1 makes 24. And finally, A6 makes 6 squared minus 1 makes 35. So in this case, the explicit formula is given, given a value n, the index of the sequence, we can compute element of the sequence. The first value of the index is 1, so it's very, very straightforward. Let's look at the next example. So here, intentionally, I chose an example where index starts not from uh, 1, but from negative 1. How does that change the problem? Again, we need to find six terms. So here we go. First term, then will be second term, and then the third term, and so on. So the first term will correspond to the first value of the index. In this case, it is negative 1. The second term will correspond to the second value of the index, in this case, n equals 0. And the third one will correspond to 1. And then we'll have uh, n equals 2. And finally, n equals 3. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Oh, and another one, n equals 4. So these are the values of the index for the first, second, third, and fourth, and, and, and all the way to sixth element of the sequence. So here we go. So the first element of the sequence will have index negative 1. And that sounds weird, but it is what it is. The index starts at negative 1, and that's the very first element of the sequence. But now the, again, I, I choose this example on purpose so that we play with the notations and we, we learn how to apply the notations accurately. But in real life, it would not make sense to start that sequence at negative 1. Most likely it will be either 1 or 0. But, okay, let's finish the example. So we will have to take the value of n. And, okay, so we'll take negative 1, right? And we will raise it to the value of n, which is, in this case, negative 1. Oh, gosh, it's a little tricky here. So negative exponents correspond to fractions. So negative, negative 1 is like dividing, is 1 over the the negative one and uh, the result is negative one. Very good. So, oops, apologies. So, the next element of the sequence is B0. And we'll have to take negative one and we'll have to raise it into that index, which is zero. Any number raised with into zero, um, into degree zero is equal to one. So, B0 is equal to one. Now we go to the next element of the sequence, b sub 1. And according to the formula, you have to take negative 1 and raise it to degree 1, resulting in negative 1. So finally, not, not finally, then we go to the b uh, sub 2, which is 1, 2, 3, 4 element of the sequence. So I'll take negative 1 and raise it to the value of the index n. And that gives us uh, negative 1 squared, uh, negative cancels, so it's going to be positive 1. Almost done. Uh, B sub 3 is negative 1 cubed, which is negative 1. And the last, the sixth element of the sequence is going to be negative 1 raised to 4, because index is equal to 4 in that case. And according to the formula, we get positive 1. So let me list those um, elements. So I'll start with negative 1. Then I'll go to 1. Then it will be negative 1. Then it will be 1. Then it will be negative 1. And then it will be 1. It's a very, very specific sequence. It alternates between negative 1 to positive 1. 
and it is accomplished by using this little technical trick. Take a negative one and start raising it into exponents. When the exponent is odd number, you get negative one. When the exponent is even number, you get positive one. So we will, we will keep that little trick in mind for the examples that will follow it. Oh, by the way, we should add the triple dot here. Okay, let's take a look at one another example. Um, we have a different formula for the sequence. And this time the index starts with uh, integer five. First value of the index is five. Second value of the index is six. Third value of the index is seven. Then goes eight. Then goes nine. And then goes 10. One, two, three, four, five, six, right? And the first element of the sequence is apparently C5, and it is equal to 5 divided by 6. I'm not going to take my calculator and evaluate the result in decimal, so it's not necessary. Uh, I actually prefer to have it in the fractional way. So the second element of the sequence, C sub 6, is going to be 6 over 7. The next element of the sequence is c sub 7, and look what I'm doing. I will put n equals 7 into the formula, and I have 7 over 8. And I go to the c sub 8, and I will have 8 divided by 8 plus 1, which is 8 over 9. And uh, c sub 9 will be 9 divided by 9 plus 1, which is 9 over 10. And finally, um, c sub 10 is going to be 10 divided by 10 plus 1, which is 10 over 11. Simple enough. Let me write down that sequence in a linear fashion. So I will have 5 over 6, that's the first element. 6 over 7, that's the second element. 7 on, over 8, that's the third element, 8 over 9, 9 over 10, and 10 over 11. And then we add dot 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 because the sequence actually continues. Now let us consider how we visualize the sequence. Uh, how do we build the graph? Well, according to the definition, the graph of a sequence consists of all points of the following format. Uh, the x coordinate is the index n, and the y coordinate is element of the sequence corresponding to index n. So here's an example. This is one of the sequences that we just computed. C sub n is given by the formula n divided by n plus 1. And the index starts at value 5. And uh, we already compute some of those values. So how do we graph it? Well, here I have a little um, tool that I use for graphing. It's called Desmos. And I hope you get a lot of use of Desmos this semester. So we can try to code it. So the first thing I will do, I will code the sequence. Uh, n is the index, and the formula for C sub n is n divided by n plus 1. Okay, that codes the element of the sequence. Then I'm going to say that n starts with 5 and then goes all the way to some large number because I cannot really do infinity in computers. Um, I have to go with some really large number. Let me call it capital N. And let, let me add a slider for capital N and I will tell them that you're going to start at, say, Five and you're gonna end at a thousand. You're gonna step by one, and by figuring this uh, point, we are going to um, make sure that our sequence um, by adding the values we can make our sequence continue for longer. I also prepared a better snapshot with all of the scaling chosen to perfection. So I will just leave it here on this slide in case you want to see a slightly better result. And the code, this must code, can also be seen in that slide over here. So very interesting behavior of the sequence. And in the next topics, we will talk about uh, how we quantify that behavior. Let's do one more example. In this sequence, we have 
uh, negative 1 raised to the power n. So we know what the outcome will be. We will we'll get an alternation of, uh, of numbers. The first element of the sequence, negative 1, then positive 1, then negative 1, then positive 1, then negative 1, then positive 1, and so on. So let's use the same app to try to graph the new sequence. We need to make a couple adjustments here. So for example, here we'll have to put negative 1, and we'll need to raise it to degree n. Now, um, the first value of the index will have to be negative 1, so let's do that. And then we should probably scale our values. So I'd like to start from negative 2 to positive 2. Yeah. And what you see is that this sequence is bouncing uh, between negative 1 and positive 1. Negative 1, positive 1, negative 1, positive 1. So in that behavior, we will say it's an oscillatory behavior. The, the sequence oscillate and it does not approach a particular value. Again, um, I already prepared a slightly better uh, graph that is uh, much uh, better scaled and the code that used to produce this graph can be seen here too. Now, not always the general formula is given to us to define a sequence. So what can we do? Now, if we have a few terms of the sequence you might be able to detect a pattern and using that pattern we might be able to write the formula for the nth term of the sequence so here we go example four find an explicit formula for the nth term of the sequence and here's the sequence three fours nine sevens 27 over 10 81 over 13, 243 over 16. So we'll look at the sequence and we'll try to see what are the patterns that we see here. And the first thing that comes to our mind is the numerator. Now, in the first, I have three, and that's the first number. Now, the second number has nine, which is three squared. The third number is 27, which is three cubed. The fourth number is 81, that is apparently 3 to the fourth, and, well, we can verify that the next one is actually 3 to the 5. Very good, we discovered the pattern. Now, what about the denominator? Well, the simple pattern that I could see, I could see 4, uh, I could see 4 plus 3, I could see 4 plus 3 plus 3, right? So uh, 4, 7, 10, they're all separated by 3. So next one is 3 plus 3 plus 3. And the last one is 4 plus uh, 3 plus 3 plus 3 plus 3, four times. I think we discovered plenty of pattern in this uh, sequence, and we are ready to propose a explicit formula. The tricky part is that we need to come up with two concepts, the index where it starts and the formula that describes the sequence. And the tricky part is that once we fix the index, that will affect the formula and vice versa. Once we fix the formula, that will determine the index. Um, as a result, we usually have to go through some trial and error before we get um, the correct formula. But let's give it a shot. So I would like to say that um, these elements will be A1. So I will start my index with 1. And uh, the first element will be A1, the second A2, the third A3, A4, and A5. And what would be a good formula for A sub n? There's probably no procedure to do it. There's no recipe how to do it. But you just stare at that sequence long enough and you realize that, wait a second, we can just say that numerator would be 3 raised to n. And you can check. A1 matches, A2 matches, A3 matches, A4 matches, A5 matches. Okay, great. Now, what is the good formula for the denominator? Well, then you say, like, wait a second. For the denominator, I'll have 4, which is repeating everywhere. 
and then I have a multiple of 3 and that multiple of 3 from where I am seeing it it's gonna be n minus 1 multiplied it by 3 and again we can check for a equals 1 uh, there's no uh, 3 so when you substitute n equals 1 uh, n minus 1 is 0 so you just have 4 in a denominator when you go for a2 that would be uh, 4 plus 3 and when you go to a5 uh, you will have 4 times 3 which is the denominator for the last one so the claim is that we've got a correct formula now some of you will notice that I might have not the best uh, I might didn't do the best job on recognizing the pattern uh, interestingly enough the same sequence can be written in a slightly different form the first element can be thought as 3 divided by 1 plus 3 uh, the second element can be thought as 3 squared divided by 1 plus 2 times 3 the third element can be written as 3 cubed divided by 1 plus 3 times 3 the fourth element can be written as 3 to the 4 divided by 1 plus 3 times 4 and finally the last element 3 to the 5 divided by 1 plus 3 times 5 in that case we can still start our index at 1 but the sequence could be defined by a different formula for example b sub a and could be computed as numerator 3 raised to n that's the same as before but denominator now looks simpler you can just say n times 3 or 3n if you wish so both formulas work as a matter of fact if you simplify the denominator you will see that this formula is precisely the same it's 3 raised to n divided by 4 plus uh, 3n minus 3 so it's going to be 3 raised to n divided by uh, 1 plus 3n so we actually discovered the same formula but it may not be obvious um, when you first see it um, you'd probably prefer to have this formula versus that formula in green that we developed the first time because it's much more refined but um, it's a correct formula nonetheless so both answers would be accepted and receive full credit let us try to solve another example on figuring out the explicit formula for the nth term of the sequence. We look at this uh, new sequence and we try to see what type of pattern we observe. And we definitely observe that the numerator is essentially increasing gradually with the step one. So you have one into two into three into four into five that's a very very simple pattern now in the denominator we have the same but shifted again it's just step one right it's it's an increment of one and here is also increment of one but starting at two. Oh, that's that's definitely a pattern that we recognize so immediately on my radar would be a formula on the form n one plus n and n would probably start at 1 here. So very good. So that formula n over 1 plus n captures the fractional part, but the, it doesn't capture one additional component. That's sign alternation, right? So there's a plus here, minus here, minus here, plus here. There's an alternation of sign. But we know what to do. Uh, we just saw an example where we had negative 1 raised to exp uh, power n. And if n is odd, we get negative 1. And if n is even, we get positive 1, right? So we, we can use that as a technical trick to make the sign alternation. So here we go. We will take negative 1 and we will raise it to n let's uh give it a shot so let me call it c sub n right and um let's try to evaluate a few terms so c1 is going to be negative one raised to degree one and multiply by one divided by one plus
plus one. So that's going to be negative one half. Uh, how about C2? Uh, negative 1 squared multiplied by 2 divided by 2 plus 1. That's going to be positive 2 thirds. So the first and the second term match. Let's try another one. C3. Negative 1 cubed multiplied by 3 divided by 3 plus 1. Uh, negative 3 over 4. Match again. So it looks like we've got a correct formula. Here we go. Um, that we detected a pattern and use that pattern to find explicit formula for the nth term of the sequence. It turns out that providing the explicit formula is not the only way to define a sequence. Some sequences are defined using recurrence relation. In the recurrence relation, one, two, or more terms of the sequence are given explicitly, and the rest of the terms are computed from the previous ones. Let's look at an example. Here's an example of recursive sequence. Um, we have one element of the sequence given to us. The first element is given to us, a1 equals 2. And to determine the rest of the elements, we are supposed to use this formula. Now, the difference from giving the explicit formula is that we'll have to recover them one by one. You cannot skip any of them because to compute next element we'll have to use the previous one. Let's give it a try. So we'll start with a1 which is given to us explicitly. For a2 we'll have to use the formula. According to the formula um, that would be n equals 2 case. I can compute a2 by taking one half of a n minus first which would be 2 minus 1 and I would have to add 5. So just to simplify, it's one half of a1 plus five. Now a1 we already have, it's two, so here we go. Um, one half times two plus five, which gives me six. Now we have a2, and we can use a2 to compute a3. Here we go, a3 is one half, according to the formula, of a, uh, we have to use, uh, instead of n, we use three, so, n minus 1 is 3 minus 1, plus 5. And um, to simplify, you'll have a sub 2 plus 5. Well, that's very good because we already know what a sub 2 is. It is 6. So we'll have 1 half times 6 plus 5, which makes it 8. Now, next one would be a fourth. So one half a third plus five. The a third is eight. So here we go. One half uh, times uh, eight plus five um, equals four plus five equals nine. So when we get to a five, we will have one half of a four plus five, which gives us one half of uh, times 9 plus 5, which gives us uh, 9 over half plus 5, which is 19 over 2. So here we go. We computed five elements of the sequence using the recurrence relation. Let's give it another example. Uh, again, we have a recurrence relation, and we would like to compute the first five terms of the sequence defined by that formula. So uh, B1 equals 3. So here we go just copy it. Now to get b2 we have to use the equation given to us. It's going to be 2 multiplied by b1 which is 2 times 3. Once we obtain b2 we can compute b3 which is equal to 2 times b2 and b2 is obtained as 2 times 3 so we'll have 2 squared times 3. Once we have b3, we can compute b4, which is 2 times b3. Um, 2 multiplied by, instead of b3, we'll substitute 2 squared times 3, and that simplifies into 2 cubed times 3. So b5 is 2 times b4, and it's going to be 2 times 2 cubed times 3 which is 2 to the 4 times 3. Now, we can compute a few more, but we already start to see a pattern. 
we start to see, but wait a second. In this case, we can actually guess out the formula. The general formula for this sequence would be 2 raised to degree n minus 1 multiplied by 3. And you can see that at least for 1, 2, 3, and 4, 5, this formula matches. So in this case, we were, not only we computed the terms, but we looked at those terms and we see we, we were able to find the general formula. For the sequence. Now, it is not always possible to guess a general formula. So if we look at the previous example, it would be much, much harder to find the answer. Although the answer um, actually exists. But um, it's, it's just much trickier to find it. But in general, if the sequence is given recursively, there is no guarantee that we can eat, produce a formula. So there are many, many sequences that we can define recursively, but the general formula for them is not done. One example of such sequence is the celebrated Fibonacci sequence. The Fibonacci sequence is defined recursively using this uh, relationship. So in particular, the first element of the sequence is 1. And the second element is also 1. But to compute the third element, so let's do like f1 equals 1, f2 equals 1. But to compute f3, we need to use the recursive relation. And to compute f3, we need to use f3 minus 1 and we need to use f3 minus 2, and we need to add them together. The f3 uh, three minus 1 is 2, so we need to f, use f2 and f1 and add them together. f2 is 1, f1 is 1, so the answer is 2. There you go, I put 2 over here. Once we found f3, we can tackle f4. Uh, look at my formula, and I need to take f, uh, Instead of n, I use 4, so it's 4 minus 1, plus f. Instead of n, I use 4, so it is 4 minus 2, and that simplifies into f3 plus f2. f3 was found just a second ago, it's 2. f2 is equal to 1, so we get 3. So f5 would be the sum of f4 plus f3. You notice that you take the previous one and the previous previous one, right? And add them together. So the previous one is 3, the previous previous one is 2, so we get 5. And f6 is going to be f5 plus f4. So it's going to be 5 plus 3, which is 8. Okay, let me put 8 over here. And f7 is f6 plus f5, which is 8 plus 5, which is 13. So the problem asks for 10 of them. We are almost there. So f8 is f7 plus f6. 13 plus 8 equals 21. And f9 equals f8 plus f7, it's 21 plus 13 equals 34. And the last one, f10 is f9 plus f8, which is 34 plus 21 equals 55. So I'd like to mention a few things about the bigger bigger mathematical landscape. So it turns out that recurrent sequence often arise when solving difference equations. And difference equations are written in terms of this finite differences. As you can see, it's an element of the sequence with the index n minus 1 minus element of the sequence with the index n. Um, 
We're not going to see them in the scores, but just to give you a little bit of flavor, uh, the key applications of these is solving differential equations, which is a lot of modeling, including pharmacokinetics, population modeling. And also, you will see those differences in the problems of interpolating the data points. Now, this whole topic is way outside of the course, but um, there's a lot of mathematics that connects polynomials, derivatives, and these difference uh, equations. So how are difference equations and recursive sequences are connected? Well, let's take a very, very simple difference equation. Here's the difference of a sub n is equal to some function evaluated of a n. And we can solve that difference for a n plus first, obtaining the following equation. And that equation looks just like a formula that defines a recursive sequence. So we can play with that formula. If we know a1, if we have a1, we can plug it into the formula to compute a2. Once we have a2, we can plug it into the formula to compute a3. Once we have a3, we can plug it into the formula to compute a4. And we can compute the entire sequence. So here's the connection. Now, some language that we would like to know, the equation that we just considered is called the first order difference equation with the meaning that it only depends on one previous term. So a n plus 1 depends only on single previous term, a sub n. Now, the Fibonacci sequence that we looked at just a few seconds ago is a second order difference equation because Fibonacci sequence, to compute the next term, we need two previous terms, f n minus 1 and f n minus 2. The sequences in life sciences are usually time series. It could be daily measurements of uh, temperature, or it can be count of population at regular intervals of time. So recursive sequences is a very, very important tool to model those time series. We usually replace the index with time. It could be some sort of measure of time. And we think a t being the current time and t plus 1 would be the next interval in time. So, for example, if we're talking about cell division, that t could be hours or days. If we're talking about animal populations, it could be months, it could be years. So the notion of one interval of time depends on the problem. So what we're going to do in this segment and in the next couple of segments, we will use recursive sequences to model uh, biological applications. And we will use sequences to reflect, say, population sizes. So in particular, we can use capital N sub T to denote population size at a particular moment of time. And based on that value, we will try to forecast depending on the problem, on the application, what's going to happen in the next moment of time. And uh, if we can establish that formula, we can determine the sequence. We can predict what's going to happen with that particular population. So here's a quick example. Suppose we have a bacterial growth, and we will think about a cell is dividing every 20 minutes. So suppose T represents the number of 20 minutes interval. So 0, 20, 40, 60, that would be t equals 1, 0, t equals 1, t equals 2, t equals 3. So um, every time the cell divides, the number of cells multiplies by 2. So in particular, if we at some point in time had n of t bacteria, after 20 minutes, at the moment of time t plus 1, we will have twice as many. Now. If we have n0 at the beginning, then we have n1 equals 2 times n0. Then we have n2 equals 2 times n1 equals 2 squared times n0. Now n3 would be 2 times n2 equals 2 cubed times n0, and so on and so forth. It, we start to realize that, wait a second, to compute uh, population of bacteria after t time periods, 
we just need to take 2, raise it to degree t, and multiply by the number of bacteria that we have at time 0. So we will recover the following formula. So in this case, we were able to transition from recursive formula to explicit formula. for the population. So how did we use recursive sequences here? We had a pretty clear understanding what happens in one interval in time. So we set up this recursive formula. And that was very important because that is our mathematical model. That model predicted the following dynamics. And then we look at that dynamics and we were able to come up with the explicit formula. But that explicit formula would not happen without the recursive sequence, the recursive relationship in the first place. Now, more generally, suppose the bacteria produces R daughter cells, not two, but R. Then we can repeat the reasoning and the model would be um, very similar, but instead of 2 raised to t, we we'll have r raised to t. That number r has a name. It's called the per capita gross factor. So what we're going to do next, we're going to work a lot, uh, work out a couple examples where we'll try to build recursive relationships from the problem description so that we can set up a recursive sequence. Now, the general approach is that we'll look at the description of what's happening in one time step and we identify where we start. Then we think about how many more individuals added population to population. And then we look at the description of the problem and we see if uh, some individuals were subtracted from population due to diseases, deaths, harvesting, uh, all sorts of reasons. And then we put it together to produce the value of the population size on the next time interval. Now let us see how this works on example of say a population of insects. Suppose at time t we have n sub t insects and we expect that uh, insects will reproduce and they will add to the population. Now we expect that um, insects will reproduce in the amount proportional to the current population size. So we will use per capita birth rate beta and we will model the inflow or the added uh, individuals as beta times nt. Now we also know that insects are going to get old and eventually die and that will also be proportional to the population size. So we will model outflow or loss of individuals as mu times nt using the per capita death rate mu. So we have the original population n sub t, the inflow beta times nt and outflow mu times nt and when we put it all together we will get uh, the population of the insects on the next time period. Let us consider another example of constructing a recursive sequence that will describe population of catfish. So here's a problem. A fish farmer has 5,000 catfish in the pond and every month because of the catfish reproduction the population of catfish increases by 8% and every month the farmer comes and harvests 300 catfish. So let's develop 
the formula, the recursive relation for the population of catfish um, as follows from these descriptions. So PN would stand for the population of catfish in month N. So we have this general idea of predicting the population on the next time period by considering what's happening during the time period. Um, we will start with the population that we currently have and then we will add the catfish that was added, the inflow, and then we would recognize that some of the catfish was removed from the population. So we will subtract the outflow. So what kind of inflow we have? Well, we know that catfish increases 8% per month. That means that 8% is the per capita, per capita growth rate. And we need to take PN and multiply by 8%. 8% corresponds multiplied by 0 0.08. Okay, that's the inflow. Now, outflow, that's the catfish leaving the population. The only reason, at least in this problem, uh, for the catfish to live is through harvesting. So 300 of catfish will be harvested each month, so there you go. 300 is removed. Note that we can simplify the formula a little bit over here. So the PN and 0 0.08 times PN can be combined into one term, resulting in 1.08 PN minus 300. And that is the formula to compute the population of the catfish on the next moment in time. Notice that that's exactly the formula that the problem wants us to establish, except um, we have a slightly different index. So um, in, in my case, I use n, and in their case, they use n minus 1. So we can, we can rewrite that. That formula can be rewritten by kind of pushing it one value of the index back. It's the same formula, but different well of the index. Okay, so here we go. And 5,000 is the starting value of size of the population, and then we can use the formula to compute um, the next. So here we go. So let me start. So P0, in part B, we want to predict the size of the population after six months. So at month zero, we have 5,000. At month one, we will have 5,000 multiplied by 1.08, and we need to subtract 300. So it, we, of course, can use a calculator, and, and we can compute in P2 and P3 and P4 and P5 by hand. But I would like to use a more powerful method. I have implemented this uh, recurrence relation in Python. Here's a simple code in Jupyter Notebook. This file will be available for you in case you want to try some Python programming. So here's the formula that we're looking for. Um, instead of P, uh, we have a population of Selman. And um, this 1.08, uh, I put it in the format 1 plus r, where r is 0 0.08. So all together it's 1 plus uh, 0 0.08. 1 .08. And it's multiplied by the previous population assignment. And then there is harvesting A, which is 300. The population starts at 5,000. And we would like to compute the first six. The first value is 5,100. Now, once we have the P1, we'll plug it into P2, so it will be 1.08 multiplied by P2 minus 300, and uh, it's going to be 1.08 multiplied by 5100, 
from minus 300, the result should come out as 5208. Once we have P2, we can use it to compute P3. And the result should come out to be as 5324.64. So uh, you can compute it on your own and you can verify the numbers that we have over here. So apparently after six months, we're supposed to have uh, 57, 33 point, okay, so we should probably, um, in terms of Salmon, it's not clear what does five, uh, 5,733.59 Salmon mean. So we will just probably say, um, okay, we, we will say, 0.5929 and we'll just say 5730 D oh sorry catfish catfish not cell catfish so here's a thing that we need to highlight when we do mathematical models we come up with answers that not necessarily have biological meaning like for example, 0.59 Selman, what, what is that, right? So we have to be careful that there's not much we can do about it. We just have to be very careful how we interpret the model and what is the applicability of the model. These questions are in general non-trivial, but in most cases we are able to explain. In this case, we would just say, let's not worry about this 0.5929. Let's just think that we have 5,730 cells. Here one more problem where we will derive a recursive sequence. Let me maximize the screen. So this one relates to drug concentration. So what happens is that when a drug is administered, so suppose we have a patient and we administered a drug, a time t equals zero. So what happens, the body starts to metabolize the drug, it gently leaving the bloodstream. And the amount of drug is reduced. However, at time equals one, uh, the patient receives a new dose. The patient receives a new dose and um, through injection or through swallowing a pill, Right, um, injection is probably the easiest because it goes straight to the bloodstream, and well, the body starts to metabolize the drug again until the next dose, so t equals two, and then then at, at the second dose uh, or third dose of the drug, uh, the patient receives another um, injection, and uh, the amount of drug is uh, increased again, and the body starts doing its job. So in, in general, we expect to see a picture like that. Depending on how much drug is injected, uh, it will determine what's happening. So in particular, we have three injections here, but you can continue the process. So oftentimes we would like to model what's happening uh, as patients receive this injection. In general, it's a little bit difficult to describe what's happening between the injections. There are some models, pharmacokinetics uh, knows uh, some nice models, usually exponential decay of some sort, but we are not ready to tackle it just yet. What we will focus today, we will focus on the amount of drug in the bloodstream right before the injection or right after the injection. So, for example, at time equals one, this would be the amount of drug right before the next dose. And that is the amount of drug right after the dose. And of course, there's a difference. Like once the dose is delivered, the amount of drug goes up. So the dis difference is the next dose. So 
in the problem that we will consider next, we will focus on, we will use the amount of drug right after the injection, right after the drug is delivered. So here we go. Suppose we have sequence C sub T denotes concentration of a drug in the bloodstream at time T. In the equal intervals in time, an amount A of the drug is administered. So the, the, the A is the concentration of the drug that is added to the bloodstream. So if you had um, this concentration, you add, you bring that concentration up exactly A units. So that distance is A. Now, then this body starts to metabolize and K is the fraction of the drug that is metabolized during the time step. Fraction K of the drug is metabolized. Okay, so part A of the problem says, um, what is the recursion formula that models the change of the drug concentration from uh, one time moment to the next time moment? Okay, why don't we try to work out on that part? So, as before, we use that very simple idea. We would like to describe what happens on the next time moment by looking at the present time moment and considering the inflow and subtracting the outflow. So what is the inflow? Well, and, and, and we're thinking about like the time period is sort of we're thinking of going from one injection to the next. So the step we're trying to make, so that would be CT and that would be CT plus one. So we need to describe what happens as we go from here to here. Okay, so we start with the concentration CT and what happens? Well, first of all, the drug is metabolized. Metabolized Metabolized drug definitely feels like an outflow, right? So that's the drug that's removed from the body. Okay, so how much of the drug is metabolized? A fraction K. So what is the amount of drug? Well, we we'll have C sub T is the concentration and the fraction K is removed. So that is how much of the drug is removed. K times C sub T. That's the metabolized drug and that's the outflow. Okay, what is the inflow? Well, inflow happens when we get the new dose. That would be that A. All right, that's our inflow. That's the new dose. I think we're done. We have our recurrence relation. The amount of drug at the next step is equal to amount of drug on the previous step. Now, let me bring these guys here minus the amount of drug metabolized plus the new dose of the drug. I can combine the first two terms into one minus K times CT. And we have our formula. CT plus first equals one minus K times CT plus A. Now, we focused on the amount of drug right after the injection, but sometimes you would like to look what happens right before the injection. So I would challenge you guys to develop that formula in your time. So part B, if we have initial concentration 120 and A equals 80 and the coefficient K is one half, plot some of the points on the graph. Okay, so, and then they want us to try to vary the values of A and K and see if it results in any interesting changes. So very well, let's give it a try. So we have a specific values at 
our initial concentration at time zero is 120. So here we go. C0 is 120. To find C1, we need to use our reculous relation. In particular, C1 equals 1 minus K times C0 plus A. Um, as the book suggests here, K is 1 half. So it's going to be 1 minus 1 half. C0 is 120. And A is 80. We put it together, it's going to be 1 half times 120 plus 80. So the first term is 60, the second term is 80, you get 140. All right, so that's C1. Once we have C1, we can compute C2. So in particular, C2 would be uh, 1 minus k times C1 plus a. Again, 1 minus k is 1 half. C1 is 140 and A is 80, so it's going to be 70 plus 80, 150. So, and then um, we can go ahead and compute some additional points using the same uh, formula, and we can try to plot them. To help me plot the formula, I also use a Python code. Here's the problem uh, formulation, and here's the code. You may recognize the formula here. That is exactly the recurrence relation that we see on the left. And uh, I ran the simulation, and these are my values. Let us compare if I have the correct answers here. So the C0 is 120, C1 is 140, C2 is 150, and the other can be computed as follows. And this is what you see as the patient takes the drug, the concentration is increases, but it eventually levels out. So the the more injection the person takes, um, the, the bloodstream concentration kind of hovers around 160. Of course, these points will be complemented. Um, you know, the, the concentration of the drug will decrease as a result of metabolization, and then. <coughs> uh, raise again at the next injection. So the question that the problem asks is what's going to happen if, if the graph looks similar for other values of A and K? Well, let's take a look. So first of all, let, let me just get that uh, picture copied. So that values were computed for <coughs> value of A equals 80 and K equals one half. So let us try to um, increase the metabolization rate. Okay, so suppose most of the drug is metabolized. So 0.9 of the drug is completely absorbed into the body. How does that affect the process? So let's run the simulation and look what's happening. If so much drug metabolizes, the concentration drops. It, instead of increasing, it drops and it becomes very, very small. And the steady concentration is below 90. And in that case, uh, you know, it may not going to treat the disease because the concentration is so low, because the drug metabolizes it so quickly. Now, let us consider the opposite situation where the drug is not metabolized but most of the drug is staying in the system in that case uh, metabolization rate is low at 0.1 let's try to run the simulation here well in that case the picture is different yet so in that case we can see that okay so we have k equals 0.1 and that's that picture. And we have k equals 0.9, this picture. So with high metabolization rate, the steady concentration is very low. With very low metabolization rate, the steady concentration is actually very high at 800 units. But um, you can see that it takes much longer to reach it. So 
if you wish, you can use the Python code to try to compute um, additional parameters and play with the value of the constant a. For our last topic in this segment, I would like to consider a very interesting example, example of logistic difference equation. Logistic difference equation is a more uh, sophisticated model than we considered so far. And I'll explain in which way. And it leads to some very, very interesting dynamics. Now, I'd like to mention that this topic is optional. So if you would like to skip it, you can skip it. That's not going to affect your homework or classwork. Nevertheless, if you would like to see, uh, it's a very, very interesting application. And I'm very glad that your textbook included it into the uh, chapter. So the models that we considered so far, they are models that correspond to grow without limitation. So in these models, there is nothing that would stop uh, the bacteria from growing. And what that means is that uh, eventually there would be so many bacteria that the entire planet Earth would feed them all. So that's, of course, not realistic. In the realistic case, as the population size grows, eventually there's a shortage of food, which affects the rate of population increase. If there is no food, usually we see some decrease, not increase. That means that per capita growth rate should depend on population size. And if it does depend on population size, that model would be more realistic this way. So in particular, one of the ways to make the model depend on the population size is to introduce this coefficient, the capacity of the resource that you know, the carrying capacity is the largest size of the population a particular resource can support. And then can see the ratio of the population versus the maximum carrying capacity. And when these population, when this ratio starts to 10 to 1, this growth should stop. So that is accomplished by introducing this coefficient 1 minus nt divided by k. So I don't want to go too much into the detail, but that growth factor that is with given that formula accounts for the size of the population. And the larger the population, the slower is the growth. So the material that I will discuss here can be found in the book. Essentially, it is convenient to change the variables a little bit. And instead of the population nt, we're looking at sort of ratio between nt and the carrying capacity up to a factor. And from the model for the population nt, you can derive the model for x. Well, essentially, you start with the definition of x, but then you would um, take that equation over here, and you would use that equation to trade in nt plus 1 for that equation as you can see that's the whole thing over here and then you work out some algebra apparently uh, bringing us over here and finally we take nt and plug it here and here and do a little more simplification and end up with uh, something that looks much much simple that is the difference equation so that equation is known as the logistic equation. The meaning is that this equation describes exactly the same model as before, but it looks a little bit cleaner. Everything is wrapped into the coefficient R max. The way we want to think about R max is the, the largest possible rate that the population can grow. And we see two limitations. If we have population equals zero, then there is no growth. And another way when there is no growth, actually there's a die out of the population when the population reaches its maximum capacity in one. So what we would like to do, we'd like to take that model um, and we would like to implement it in the computer and see what kind of graphs we get. And the results are very interesting. So in particular, um, there are values of the parameter R max that 
depending on the value, the behavior of the computed sequence is different. Uh, it turns out that when the value of R between 1 and 3, you will have a picture like that. So you will start with whatever initial value, then the model will do its job, and eventually you will reach a steady state for the system, you know, from year to year, from time moment to time moment, the system doesn't really change. Now, for values of R bigger than three, um, we will have instability. So apparently, instead of reaching a particular, so interestingly enough, um, uh, this model has a steady state. But um, when R is greater than three, the sequence cannot reach that steady state. It, it starts to oscillate back and forth. Now, to find that steady state, it's not very difficult. There is a one simple trick. Uh, in the steady state, like assuming that nothing changes, right? Assuming that from time moment to time moment, nothing changes, the, the population should obey the following formula. R max multiplied by x times y. That equation has two solutions, x equals zero, and x equals R max minus one divided by R max. And these solutions are steady state. So if you say x equals zero, and plug it into the model, then the x t plus one will come out as zero and, and it will stay zero forever. Or if you take that second solution, R max minus one divided by R max and plug into this model again, on the next step, you will get the same value. So it's, it's steady state again. So it turns out that zero is unstable. X equals zero means there's no population. But if there is at least a couple of members of the population, which is like maybe very, very small deviation from zero, then they start to reproduce and replicate and eventually grow to the steady state of the population size. Now, the second value is stable if value of r max is between 1 and 3. Now, uh, that means that if you take a few elements like, I don't know, some disease, some disaster, so the population suddenly drops below that steady state, it will push itself back to the steady state. It's a stable equilibrium. If you start above it, if you start below it, it will bring itself back to that line. Now, the situation is slightly different for r greater than 3. Uh, in this case, we also have a steady state, but it's the steady state is unstable. The system will pull away from it and start oscillate. Let me show you how it works using the Python code. So here's a code with a description, and a copy of this code will be provided on Canvas. So we have this simple formula coded in that's the that's the logistic equation you can probably recognize it easily here and we will start with the initial data uh, the, the first element of the sequence seven or eight and for starters we will take the stable value of the coefficient r max of 1.5 so we will take that we will run it we will have that picture that you see here Notice that we can change different values. So instead of 7.8, we can try, I don't know, just uh, one half. That's not going to change the stability. A little above, a little below, the system is returning to its value. So, okay, let me go back to 7.8. Now, when we go above 3, like say 3.2 as suggested in the book, then the system becomes unstable. Now, uh, there are certain things that you can kind of, you can use calculus, you can use um, a little bit of um, analysis to realize that uh, the moment um, one of the elements of the sequence is computed negative, then all of the rest will be computed negative as well. And, um, 
the moment you try to compute something that's above one, you will necessarily produce a negative element. So all of this little thinking you can do. So <clears throat> the only way for the system to keep physical meaning is uh, when x, uh, the, the elements of the sequence are between zero and one. And the system is doing a good job keeping them between zero and one, but it's oscillating. So it's a very interesting pattern. So um, how does that relate to biology? Now, think about a colony of some organisms. And for one colony, the reproduction rate is kind of slow. They reproduce slowly and uh, they will reach a steady state. But think about a colony that reproduce massively, very fast, like, a, I don't know, a fruit fly, right? Then uh, it is possible that the colony will start develop oscillations. It will go from high to low to high to low to high to low oscillations. It will oscillate as it goes. And it would be normal for that colony. So you can um, see patterns of uh, repetitive, like the, the cyclic pattern um, coming out from that logistic equation. Now, let's push the boundaries a little bit. So instead of 3, let's put like 3.2, let's put 3.6. So now you see a more sophisticated pattern, right? So you now start seeing that like it's still oscillatory, but there is not just two levels between the bounces. It is it has a pattern, very complicated pattern. Now, let's increase that value even more, like to 3.9. Uh, well, that pattern becomes more elaborate. Uh, and we can see what's happening in the long run. Right now we're only computing five solutions, but we can just go ahead and compute 5,000. Let's see what's happening here. And when you compute 5,000, then you get a very, very interesting picture. So <clears throat> you'd probably call this uh, almost random, right? So there's a lot of stochastic dots over here. And there's no obvious pattern. Uh, there, there is some dense areas in the top and in the bottom and, and somewhere in the middle. Definitely nothing around the steady state, right? So what we see here, see here, in that, that picture is very chaotic. So we see emergence of a chaos from a logistic equation. That's one of the reasons this equation is so famous because you can use logistic equation to um, produce chaos, something that's non-periodic, non-predictable. So, which is something very contrary in mathematics. Chaos is something that's random, but this is not random. That's sequence computed from the previous element to the next, previous to the next. There's absolutely nothing random. Yet, the patterns that emerge are non-repetitive and they, uh, they look very random. So, which, which is a very big uh, observation in mathematics. Now, to finish off, let me show you something very interesting. So let me go back to something reasonable like 3.2. And we have our simple oscillation. So maybe if we don't need 5,000. Let's just focus on 500 points. So suppose I start at a steady state. A steady state is given by the formula 1 minus 1 divided by r max. and I will add a tiny perturbation to this steady state, just maybe like 10 to the negative 6. So I'm right at the steady state, but a little bit off. Look what happens. In the beginning, it's the system states near the steady state, but little by little, those tiny per oscillations start to produce and eventually goes to the oscillatory state as before. So it turns out it's very, very difficult to keep that <coughs> steady state for logistic equation. Even if you have a smaller perturbation, you just need to wait a longer time. So let, let me just add one zero, so I'll reduce the perturbation. But what happened, the fork just shifted a little bit. So for every zero that I add here, we will see that fork happening at the end. So now let me remove it all together. So now the only perturbation that I have is the round off that's intrinsic to the system. So for the round off, we don't see anything at 500, but let's see if we can get 5,000. 
Well, probably not 5,000. How about 10? Um, well, let's just add a tiny itty bitty prohibition. Zero, 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 zero. Yeah, so how about this guy? There we go. Back to the prohibition. So apparently something is uh, perfectly matching, so we don't see the perturbation when I don't explicitly add it, but that was a very, very tiny amount added on the top of the uh, steady state. Now, zero is not better. So if you put zero, the same stuff. It started at zero, then it started to oscillate between these two. Okay, so I hope you found something new today uh, with the logistic equation and this experiment, and that concludes this segment. Thank you very much for watching.